One of the things that you need to know about New York is how we started off as a port town. Uh, the city was a city of a working waterfront. Gradually, of course, the port functions as well as the industry that grew up around them were driven away by global forces. There is very little that, in our view, is more important than reclaiming that waterfront. We have a moment in time when we think we can do that politically. We are seizing it with a fury that I think is uncharacteristic for New York development. This is a major, major effort to open the waterfront to the people of New York City. There is this rush from the part of the government to reclaim the waterfront but we sometimes do not understand what they mean by reclaiming the waterfront. What we have seen is building something at the expense of something else, destroying one part at the expense of the other. Look, for example, at Brooklyn, where almost every inch of the Brooklyn waterfront right now is undergoing some sort of transformation. I would suggest that within 10 years, almost none of it will be recognizable. I do not know how New York City can survive just by building luxury buildings everywhere. We need to diversify our waterfront. We need to have a waterfront that will allow for the different stakeholders to be part of it. It's so important that we educate our public because once it's done, that will be it. The waterfront will be gone. We have one of the most spectacular harbors in the world. It's much more beautiful than Hong Kong, which is considered a fabulous harbor, because it's much bigger. It goes everywhere. It's got endless possibilities, all kinds of creeks you can go up and things you could do. And right now, it's uh, from the point of view of the, the people who are on here every day, it's a desert. I came to think of the waterfront as kind of pathologically averse to actually touching water. Everywhere, there were impediments first to get inland to the water's edge and then you couldn't actually stick your hands or feet in the water almost anywhere except for a few spots. My junior high school was called the Hunts Point Peninsula School and you could see it on the subway maps you know that Hunts Point kind of stuck out into some kind of water body I didn't know what it was but you know so we knew that there was water around but no we never got a chance to see it. I will remember the exact moment um, when I actually fell in love with New York. And I was coming up the FDR Drive at night. I looked back at the Manhattan Bridge and the Brooklyn Bridge in Lower Manhattan, which was illuminated, and it just occurred to me that New York City was a city of water, but still you could never actually get to the water. Everyone always says, why doesn't New York make more use of its waterfront? And the main reason was that there was a whole maritime industry there, shipping and, and other kinds of industry. Prior to any type of automotive transportation, to transport coal, gravel, any type of fuel, to go along the river was the cheapest mode of transportation. You, you have to envision uh, the, the New York waterways uh, the way they were in the 19th and early 20th centuries, they were an incredible superhighway of every boat imaginable, from the smallest sailboat to the largest uh, battleship. Everything, one after another, was streaming down those waterways. The East River were 
was the highway of, of New York City. And that's why industry usurped a lot of the land along the river. Lower Manhattan was a particularly lively, roughish area. You had the sailors and the taverns, the brothels, and you have all this commerce that was there to fit and supply the ships. So basically, you had a very lively texture going all the way to the water's edge. Although the river started to get polluted, the river was used for recreation purposes. They boated in it, they swam in the river, and even in the winter, people would ice fish if parts of the river were frozen. The uh, waterfront uh, eventually moved away to New Jersey, and all that came about partly through containerized shipping. We needed more backspace to load the containers, and Manhattan's real estate is too valuable, so New York, which had had the greatest port in the world, found itself uh, losing that. And at the same time, uh, planners, largely Robert Moses, focused on the automobile, and the only place to actually put highways was at the exteriors of, of the city. And that created uh, the complete destruction of access to the waterfront. The nostalgia for the port, the nostalgia for manufacturing along the waterfront is gone. And what's left are you know, hulking warehouses and rotting piers that could be a real asset in a period when we are growing very rapidly. So we have an imperative to actually find places for people to live and also at the same time to give them places for recreation. The city of New York, especially Manhattan, has forgotten about the port, forgotten how vibrant this port still is. And unfortunately, they don't know the importance of the marine transportation system to their lives. The goods actually go in now to the large terminals that are mostly based in New Jersey, but it is still one operation. This port needs a very large support arm to it. That arm is based almost entirely within the city of New York. Those are the tugboats, the barge companies, and the repair facilities. Throughout the history of New York City, it has been a working waterfront. And there are meaningful jobs and blue-collar jobs that should and must be protected. There's a lot of areas within this port that are not viable to support the maritime industry. Those areas, everyone's more than willing to give over to recreation, parkland, housing. Not a problem. There are certain areas that need to stay maritime-specific. Once it reverts to a different use, we will never get it back. The port will die. For instance, we have lost one of our repair facilities to a box store. We have a backlog in this port, last I heard, of about two years on getting into the remaining repair facilities. That repair facility was greatly needed. Once you eliminate jobs that have always been there, you are, in fact, destroying the low-income community in that waterfront. We can have meaningful jobs, we can have sound economic development, and that one should not come at the expense of the other. Without the, the working waterfront, this city would not function. Even though everyone says the roads are too crowded, they would be much, much more crowded if the amount of goods that are moved by water went away. The air quality, same thing, because if you replace one barge with a thousand trucks, Obviously, there's an impact there. I don't think the working waterfront is doomed. I think its future is just limited. Land is our most constrained resource. So we will have that working waterfront where it makes financial and spatial sense. But where it doesn't, we've got to let it go. The vision for the waterfront, it depends on where we're talking about. You start at the border of Queens at the Newtown Creek and extend all the way down to the Manhattan Bridge. There'll be a beautiful waterfront esplanade the entire way. Across the river, there'll be a beautiful new park extending from the Battery all the way up to the Lower East Side. The harbor district that we are creating out of all of these things 
we think will be one of New York's great tourist destinations. We've ended up uh, falling back on this idea of the emerald necklace around the entire New York City waterfront because we don't have the confidence to build uh, vital pieces of the city again. So you're basically getting this kind of weird trade-off where these humongous anti-urban towers within a park are introduced and the people get a strip of parkland. And the reason why I consider it anti-city is because you don't have the real interaction between the waterfront and the streets that abut it. You're taking out all the vitality at street level. For instance, Valley Park City feels like a somewhat suburban office park. And it's never really been integrated properly into the, 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 the weave and the life of the New York City streets. And the same thing with Hudson River Park. What you get is this very narrow strip of green, and then you've got the highway, and then across the street from the park, you're starting to get one high-rise residential luxury place after another. And somehow, we don't seem to uh, realize that there are other options. If you have new modern structures all along the river, I think it would become a sterile waterfront. There are many developers that would just as easily tear things down to put up new structures, but it erases all industrial history along the river. We cannot give the waterfront to the highest bidder and for those highest bidder to decide what is best for the community and what is best for the waterfront. The communities, they are the experts. They know better. What was happening here under the administration of Ed Koch was going to be a huge mega development known as Riverwalk. And it would have meant that there would be five huge residential towers built on platforms into the East River, a convention center, and basically it would prohibit the community from having access to the river. We just didn't want that to happen. We desperately needed open space, and this was the opportunity to do something. And we determined that we were going to fight, we were going to win. A former Department of Sanitation official actually said, with regards to the city, every beautiful body needs a good disposal system. In the South Bronx in particular, we realized that we were the disposal system. We were going to be the community that was going to handle 40% of the city's residential waste. If we thought that, you know, the, the diesel trucks barreling through our neighborhood, through residential streets was bad, if we knew that the smells were, were obnoxious now, then we could only imagine what it was going to be like, you know, with an extra 5,200 tons per day, you know, coming through this neighborhood. We were in a position where we had to convince the State Department of Environmental Conservation that we actually were a worthwhile community that did have plants of our own. The problem was we didn't. People said, you know, you can't fight City Hall. What are you going to do? And I said, well, we'll see. It didn't hurt that we had over a 1,000 names on a petition so that they could see it wasn't just a community board, but a, an entire community. You know that old saying, community doesn't plan to fail. They fail to plan, and suddenly it rang. It never really occurred to me before, but it, it was so true. We knew what we didn't want, but we did not know what we wanted. And so we actually started doing community planning sessions. At that time, we were the poorest congressional district in the country. And so asking people to dream about what they wanted in their community was really hard at first. It was, it was challenging. We were not confrontational. We just hung in there and didn't let up. So we were able to get Riverwalk off the drawing board. Suddenly, it just started to flow, and people started to realize, like, you know what, there is a waterfront here. How come I have to travel as far as I do to get to a waterfront? It's like, you know, my people are from the Caribbean, or my people are from down south. You know, we love the water. There's a natural affinity to it. And, you know, why don't we have that, you know, in our neighborhood? We met with EDC, and I suggested that we could make our park here as an environmental theme park, planted with native trees that would require less water, 
and also attract birds and beneficial insects and have a space to provide environmental education, cultural programs, and amazingly, you know, this was accepted. People started recognizing, okay, we, we have a waterfront. And at that point, like, I literally went back home and, like, wrote the proposal, got the money, and that was, like, the beginning of the, the waterfront restoration in Hunts Point. We did the groundbreaking for it just a year ago. We pulled about 10,000 tires off of it because it was just considered a dumping ground. No one would have done this for us. Frankly, we worked like dogs for it. We had to convince everybody and their mother that this was a place that was worth investing in. We had this wonderful opportunity to transform what was a rat-infested garbage dump into a beautiful, natural, healing, peaceful, restorative place called Stuyvesant Cove Park. But it took a long time to do it. And it's still a work in progress, but it started. A lot of the communities not only want to work to make sure that we beautify the waterfront, but at the same time, we have to make sure that in terms of developing public access into the waterfront, that it provides for the various different interests of the community, from just walking, passive recreation, to going to the water. Currently, most New Yorkers still consider the river, the harbor, to be scenic features at best. The fact is that the water itself is not yet something that we have an intimate relationship with. The greatest fault uh, in all the developments I've seen is that there's an emphasis on waterfront access and not water access. So lots and lots of promenades, and you see all these computer-generated uh, illustrations of people biking and fishing and walking and strolling and, and looking at the views. but. Unless people can get onto the water, they don't start really connecting with it and caring about the water. The esplanade treatment of the water's edge has a lot to recommend it, but the way it's treated now, it's you can only go so far, and here's a, a beautiful railing, a steel railing that'll go along the whole edge of the river. You won't find a place where you can actually get your hands wet, where if you're in a small boat, you could stop and come on to land. There's no interconnection of land and water anymore. The pressure is against incorporating nature into the waterfront because it's much easier to build a cement wall, 90 degree angles, a straight row of trees on the top, separate the land from the water. Engineers like that and lawyers like that, and therefore developers like that. At the South Cove of Battery Park City, on 9-11, when they had to evacuate uh, thousands of people onto the water, they had to get a, an acetylene torch and cut through the steel railing in order to get people away from the disaster. That's a, just a, a metaphor for the way we're thinking about bringing people to the edge but keeping them away from actual uh, uh, contact with the, the water itself. We work to develop a program to buy canoes and kayaks and teach people water safety and how to paddle, essentially just get them out on the water there, like in their own backyard. It was a really you know, incredible thing, and most people, especially the little the kids and even some of the old people that grew up here, like Miss Ross, who you know, grew up down south and who hasn't lived here for 40 years but had never thought that at one point in her life she'd be able to take a canoe on the Bronx River. Getting her out there was just amazing. When you're on a boat, you're just feeling the wind rushing you through the river. Like, you don't have nothing to do there, and you go listen to nature and be with nature. Every kid should be allowed to come here, because it's so beautiful, and it's the Bronx, and you mostly don't see anything good here. There are a lot of boats out there, but there could be a lot more. Unfortunately, younger people aren't getting a chance to learn how to sail. They're not learning how to row. They're not learning how to handle boats as much as they used to. And that's something that can be encouraged in the schools. So it's no surprise that the number of people who are out there on the water is small in comparison with the, the, what it could be potentially. It, it's not preposterous to think of New York City as a place where you could go from one neighborhood or community to another by boat. 
50 years ago, there were probably upwards of 100 different ferry lines in this city. It went down to one, and that was the Staten Island Ferry. And we're now back up. It is expanding. People have realized the ease and the efficiency of going by water. One of our challenges and one of the things that we seek to do in the plan is not only expand ferry service, but also to make sure that ferries work well with buses and other aspects of the land system. So that if you take a ferry, say, to 34th Street on the East River, you have to be able to get to Fifth Avenue. And it's an easy walk on a nice day, perhaps, but you know, you also have to make sure that you're prepared for how people are going to get there on a snowy day in, in January. Right now, we're starting to plan for accommodating more water transportation, but we're not accommodating even smaller vessels. And once you start to accommodate water transportation, it's not that much to put some floating docks next to them, and those become magnets for the life on the water. The communities out on Long Island Sound almost all have a town dock. If you go to Port Washington, the, the, the scene around the town dock is spectacular. Boats come in, boats go out, people get on, people get off, dogs and cats and then all the rest of it. And the, the people without boats love to just spend uh, some time there. It's a destination. Why can't you have a, a town dock at Red Hook or a town dock in uh, Williamsburg, you know, and up in Newtown Creek in, in Flushing and all around the city? The river should not be treated like a gorilla in the zoo that should be observed for educational value and aesthetics but not touched. Having railings and things like that that you can lean on and look at the water is no substitute for actually getting into the water. When people get into the water, they care about the water, they become the best constituency for the health of the water systems. The feds are mandated to maintain waterways consistent with current usage. What that means is whatever the locals are doing there, the feds have to make sure it's healthy enough for them to be doing it. If they're swimming, the feds are mandated to keep those waterways healthy for swimming. The best thing we could all do for the river in our backyard is jump in. Today was one of about 10 open water swims that are offered by the Manhattan Island Foundation and was a 2.4 mile swim down the Hudson River and it's really, really cool. It's really fun. You don't see anyone, you're just swimming along on your own. You really feel quite vulnerable. It's pretty crazy. It's like one of the craziest things I think I've ever done. It's pretty intense, yeah. Yeah. It's, it gets really choppy around uh, around Battery Park City, like, I guess where the island curves. All of a sudden, you know, the water starts tasting really nasty. And there were, I guess there were a lot more boat fumes. I always think about how sad it is that we grew up in a world where every time we see a body of water, the assumption is that it's polluted. You know, I think that's sort of a horrifying thing. And uh, it's encouraging that this body of water is being cleaned up and that there are people who, are, who have a stake in making it cleaner. If you see people swimming, you know you're in a very healthy place. So the idea of swimming has caught on big time, except after a rain when all the toilet and everything else flushes directly untreated into the river. Sewage is the limiting factor to recreation, like swimming, fishing, where you touch the water. Sewage is the limiting factor to more of that in our neighborhoods. We still suffer from the combined sewage overflows because when it rains, particularly if it rains hard, the water flushes into the sewage treatment centers and they don't have the capacity. Because if you think about it, we use over a billion gallons of water a day in this city, but that's a fraction of what we get in a major rainstorm. So the system just can't handle four, five, ten times the flow. And as a result, in order to make sure that the sewage doesn't back up into our homes and onto our streets, they have to release this untreated water into the harbor. New development should be linked to the capacity of our infrastructure to support it. And all of our treatment plants are already over capacity. So as a society, we would want more sewage treatment plants, but nobody wants it in their backyards. Mother Nature has all sorts of ways to absorb stormwater and let it flow into the waterways at a normal pace. 
can we expand the use of the, the blue belt, where the wetlands serve also as these stormwater holding areas? Can we then use the natural features that actively clean the water in the harbor, such as shellfish? New York used to have one of North America's greatest shellfish habitats. Over time, as the, the harbor got polluted, they all died off. And today, we actively have to reseed them. So as the water runs through, say, an oyster bed, the oyster is filtering out and eating some of these things. We have an opportunity to build nature into the waterfront. That involves putting some kind of intertidal features. If you have any kind of little slope, first the algae will attach, then the little barnacles, then the little fish and crabs come in, then the bigger fish, then the birds. It works very well if you put down the right substrate. Nature takes over and does the rest. Now that the water is much cleaner, and particularly if we can get it ever more clean, the opportunity exists to reconceive exactly what waterfront uses could be so that they more closely integrate boating opportunities and fishing and potentially in certain places swimming. Uh, I'm from the Bronx here. I work at Pathmark on, over there by Bruckner Boulevard. And when I get off, I normally come down to a class in point here and do a little fishing just to, you know, relax. It's low tide now, but the tide will be coming in. And when it comes up, it's great fishing. That's when they come in to bite. Oh, we catch a striped bass, flounder, and we got crabs out here too. Sometimes you catch an eel. Once you throw your hook out and whatever comes back in, it's going to be something good. Just take them, fry them. You can bake them in the oven with some little lemon and adobo, and, and it's very tasty. People can coexist with nature. Even if you're not an environmentalist and you don't even like animals and insects and don't care about the birds much, even subconsciously, we have a feeling of well-being when we see that nature is thriving. It gives a sense that the city is a viable place to live and work. If we want to incorporate nature into our new waterfronts, we can. It's not that difficult. It's just that the will has to be there for it. People from all ages, all income levels, everyone in the community should be part of a sound, balanced planning process for the waterfront. We have to instill a sense that change will not come unless people demand it. This is the way communities empower themselves, by raising their voices and telling the politicians, the elected officials, you know, we elected you and your role is to listen to us. We have one opportunity to do it right. We need to think much harder about how to reintroduce water-based functions to the water's edge. The community and the city and the developers never get together and say, what could we do here that would be exciting, that would be something different? For instance, you know, you could have um, a nightclub docked off of the uh, waterfront, or you could have um, a gambling casino, or you could have a movie theater or something like that. You want people to go to the waterfront because something vital is happening there. I truly, truly believe it is not enough to advocate you know, for a certain principle or a series of principles or philosophy, whatever. You really do have to, you know, especially in a community where folks you know, have been traditionally been maligned. You know, you have to like give them reasons to believe in things, do something that they can actually point to, look to, you know, taste, touch, feel essentially understand as something that is absolutely impacting their lives in a positive way. Seeing these things happen, knowing that there's actually dollars coming into a community for waterfront development where there was none, you know, is just the coolest thing in the world to me right, right now. Um, I just can't imagine. My favorite moment may have been the first time I anchored overnight with my family in, in New York Harbor. And we woke up in the morning at sunrise and there was the Statue of Liberty and we were making breakfast on the boat and looking out at Manhattan and the Jersey Shore and 
towards the Verrazano Bridge, the Narrows. Huh, it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. And so my kids, it was imprinted on them that this is an experience they wanted to have more and more. We will never have enough parkland to match the open space we have of the open waterways. This is our wilderness. And there's something just wonderful about jumping off your kayak to cool off on a 99 degree day and swimming with the skyline in front of you. This is meant to be enjoyed as a waterfront city and, and as a, a place of being on the water. So that if you love the paddling culture that was here before European contact, you should be able to get out there and paddle and feel what they did. You know, if you're somebody who just loves Walt Whitman and wants to ride the ferry back and forth and read his poem about that experience, great. It should be a wonderful smorgasbord, you know, of, of water activity. You know, it should be something that's diverse as New York is.